My name is Chris and Fanzon. You are listening to the Hidden Doors podcast. Upcoming is my conversation with Kosman. He is an author of the book Hazard, How to Change Your Destiny or Love It Now. He's also a spiritual evolution teacher, and we talk about how he's helping people and what he talks about in his book. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you do, give me a thumbs up on this video. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that damn notification bell so you can stay up to date on more videos and podcasts coming down like this. I hope you enjoy it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for coming back on the podcast. We had, uh, what, two months ago we did a, we did a podcast talking about your book. Something like that. And then the quality was just awful. Mainly the, I was using a bad program. I got a brand new program. We're in good shape. So how have you been? How is everything going? I've been good. I've been good. Uh... Where in the world do you live? Well, I live in Romania right now. So that's where I reside. Got it. I'm horrible with geography, but Romania. Well, so it's next to Ukraine. Let me put it like Got it. Okay. So your people are probably on edge right now, huh? Yeah. Right I, saw, I saw a lot of people with water from buying water at the supermarket and things like that. Yeah. It's a crazy freaking world. Yeah, hope every, hopefully just everything goes okay and you guys are safe and everything. Um, but yeah, how uh, how have you been? You doing a lot more promotions on the book review? I know you got the book that came out. What? How's that going? Yeah, it's, it's going. I actually uh, scheduled some upcoming interviews for it. and uh, Nice. Yeah. So what, did you self-publish or is that published by a, a publisher? No, it's self-published. Nice. You got, yeah. Uh, it's Self-publishing is so easy now with the technology these days that you might as well just self-publish it yourself, you know? It is, but if you don't have a know-how and what this entire process entails, then you're <laughs> up for some challenges, let me put it like that. Yeah. I, uh, I hear you on that. Well, let's talk all about it, but let me give you the chance to, why don't you just like introduce yourself a little bit and say what you do, because this way everyone gets to know who, who you are and what you do and what, what you, uh, what creations you've made. This book is one creation. I'm sure you have other things. So what, what do you, what's your little intro? So my name is Cosman and, uh, Basically, I uh, help people reconnect with something bigger than them. I call it the universe, or you can call it endless love. Or uh, sometimes I uh, speak about the source, quote unquote. And uh, it is through that connection with infinity, with something that is way bigger than us, uh, through that, we get to understand the real reason why things are happening in our lives the way that they do. So basically, I, I help people overcome their fears and their struggles with deep-rooted insecurities or limiting beliefs that they might have even by by reestablishing that connection with the universe by got it making that link and through that you as i said you get to to better understand why the struggles that you face or the challenges that arise in your life uh, come about why do why are they there got it and one of the biggest ways that you can show uh, people how to do this is through the book that you have. But do you have anything else? Do you also coach on the side? Like what other things do you do outside of the book? Yeah, I uh, also offer people personal, personalized guidance. 
So that's uh, a one-on-one coaching with them. Uh, Got it. Um, after I have a long-term package and also a short-term sessions. So it's Got it. okay. something for everyone. When did you publish your book? When was it officially published? Officially, it was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So right when it kicked off in April Got 2020. It. April 2020. Uh, when it, when the hell did the pandemic happen? Like at March? The, at the end of March 2020. Got it. Okay. So, because some people uh, got really, I don't know if it was bored, but they just found a channel within the pandemic of being locked down. And one of those channels is like writing. So a lot of people wrote books, I feel like, during the pandemic. But you wrote it before the pandemic. Yeah, the, I actually yeah. wrote uh, the chapters uh, individually. They weren't linked together. So I started writing somewhere in, I think, 2018. I just Got started it. writing down my thoughts about a certain topic. And after that, took a break and started to write on something else. And close to the time when the pandemic hit, I was looking at these materials and I was like, well, maybe I can put these together into something for the people that are struggling with their challenges, with their, with the vicissitudes of life, if you will. Vicissitudes. What a freaking great word, huh? <laughs> Let me see the cover of the book. So what's, I, I can't see it. Uh, I remember it was a really nice cover. Yeah. So I forget that is, um, it's a person holding a string of yarn. Is that? Yes, exactly. It's a very nice cover. Who did it? Did you, did you do that? No. Uh, I actually had a, a graph, uh, graphic designer do this. So, and this it's is very the, nice. the back with the water and the hood. Nice, nice, nicely done. So how is the book um, structured? Like how many chapters are there? How do you like, is each chapter talking about different things? How does that work? Yeah, so there are actually 15 chapters inside of it. And 50? The, yes. You say 50? Got it. No, no, 15. 15. Mm. Not 15. I was going to say, what is like every other page a chapter? Okay, 15. No, and 15, and they're actually not related per se but everything comes together just like life is like we have different things like different facets of life that we're dealing with like we, we can we might struggle with our relationships with our intimacy and five years down the line or ten years down the line we might not understand why our child left us or something else happened to us and but it's all coming together in a way that we are not perceiving moment to moment because we're too caught up on what is going on. We have our nose and our face too close to our attention basically is too close to what is happening in the in the in our proximity. Yeah. So, it's like uh is it it's it's a similar a metaphor and analogy would be like if you took like a, a really zoomed in picture of me, let's say you're looking at me as a picture, but you mm -hmm. zoom, 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 like maybe here or my eye. It's so close. You don't even know what the hell you're looking at, but then you take a step back and mm -hmm. go, oh, this is the person. I mm -hmm. Now I know what I'm looking at. The analogy is when you're so like in and you can't take a step back and look at the bigger picture of things, sometimes it's hard to see how all these work together. This is actually a metaphor that I use to, to, to describe these things to uh. my clients also. I, I give a, the analogy with a, a glass of water. So if you're, if you're holding the glass of water here, you might see that it's water. But if you're holding it too close, you won't even see the glass, not only the water. So from our standpoint, from the living standpoint, we see certain things. If we were dead, for example, like this call here, 
we might experience and perceive everything entirely different. Yeah. So is the, cause there's different ways of, I guess, writing, um, it, uh, trying to explain concepts of a book, right? Maybe there's, I've seen some people do it in a fiction, a fiction type of book, but the fiction story has real life, uh, people who have experienced real life examples, just like fictionalized names and everything. Or there's like, it's a nonfiction and you're just talking through your story or you're talking through principles that are helpful to deal with. How is the book like, is it how, like, how is it, uh, explained, I guess? I would say that it, it accounts for both. So I use examples in the book, real life examples. So people can relate in a certain way to them. And I also encompass them through principles or through, through understandings, through uh, what we that I say is the principles of the universe. How does the universe govern this world? Like we have the force of gravity, the force of physics. That is a rule. That is a principle that is governing every other force that is here. Got it. Okay. Uh, what gave you like, what gave you the inspiration to write this book? Just the, the randomness of each moment, like the synchronicity of every encounter. Like you and I are meeting here, but we didn't plan for this. It would like what I'm speaking right now. I'm it's, in this moment, it's coming up through me. It's not like I have a, a speech somewhere written on the wall and I'm reading it out loud. I don't know what I'm about to say in five seconds. So from this inquisitive nature that I had from a very young age, I was always gauging and looking around like, how does this work? Why is this so random? Like. At one moment, things are going our way, quote unquote, and a year later, everything is awful and everything is wrong and the way that we perceive it changes all of a sudden. And then two months later, it shifts again. It changes again to something better. We have hope again. We have a, our dreams are close to us again. And... It seems random. It seems like there is nothing behind it. It's like we might not see the real reason why things are occurring the way they, they do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that God, God or the divine or the destiny doesn't know. So do you remember, do you remember the day, week, or month that you said, I'm going to write a book? Uh, like, what, do, you, do you remember what, what made you want to write the book? Like, like I said... You know, is it like, I, hey, I, I, have all this, I have all this knowledge of the world and I've been so interested in everything. I want to give it... I want to share these principles with other people who I have been coaching more broadly. Is, it, is that like the inspiration for the book? Yeah, but it wasn't a, like a a thing that I was set to, to do, like, I will write a book in two years and I, I start writing tomorrow. Like, it came up to me. Yeah, it just it came up on me in a way. So, But that's, that, a, that's a very interesting thing, though, that came up to you, right? Like, it, it might be random, but that day might have been particularly interesting for you. You know, it's like one day you're like, I'm going to write a damn book. <laughs> you yeah. know, must have been a nice day. Must have been a challenging day because writing a book's not easy either. Yes, yes, and uh, I remember the day when my the title came to me. Like I, I was, I had, I had all these paragraphs and a few chapters written, and I was like, okay, I can put this together because they are linked in a way. But what title should I use here? And I remember that I was talking to somebody, and I was explaining some of these principles to that person, and suddenly. In my speech, the word hazard came. And 
something something hit me in that moment and i i forgot for for a second i and i even asked the person what did i told you the last phrase that i what what did i say can you repeat that to me because i it, it jumped my <laughs> mind for a moment and that person oh you said the hazard of hazard oh that's that has a ring to it nice so it just it came to you it came yeah. to you without realizing the title Exactly. And I know that a lot of people, when they, when they uh, read the word hazard or when they hear the word hazard, it has a connotation like uh, danger, like something that uh, is uh, warning, warning them in a way of something that will happen. But it's not viewed through that perspective it's actually in the book it's a substitute or a synonym for destiny or for fate if you will like everything that takes place be it good or bad positive or negative is within the confines of our fate of our destiny of hazard so what um like what got you to you said you've always been like this, where you've always been interested in these types of theories and principles at, at a very young age. When did you start? At what age did you start becoming interested in this type of stuff? I have recollections from being three or four years old and reading a lot of encyclopedias about the galaxies about the universe, the cosmos, each planet, and the forces that were governing there. Like, we are so small compared to how big this place is. And I was always attracted, like, fascinated to the point of, I always felt misplaced somewhat here on this planet. Like, I, I always felt that my home is somewhere above but I am here to experience what I have to live through. But I had that connection in me with the place above from a very young age. And I was, as I said, I had an inquisitiveness in me, in my body, that was always attracted to things and how do they work, basically. How do people work? How do social dynamics work? What is governing each moment and why are the things happening the way that they are happening? Because just let me let me give you a, a few examples with the work that I've done with some of my clients. Like some people have came to me and explained that they are at the crossroads in their life and they feel misplaced or they cannot find a home and after a few sessions, they told me that, look, you know what happened to me today, Cosme? Like a dog was following me around and I, I felt pity for him. And I do not understand why is he following me. He had followed me a day before and even today. And I saw that dog again. And I do not understand why. Is it, does this mean something? And I remember that I told that person that, look, in a way, that dog is trying to tell you, is trying to show you that you are like him, like you are searching for a home. You are trying to find your place just like he is. It might not be that obvious to you, but it's signaling to you where you are at in that moment. You, uh, what's the right word? You, you seem like a very deep thinker. <laughs> so let me ask you this question. Do you think, because you explained that you feel like there was a connection somewhere else, but you're experience it, experiencing it here on planet Earth. Um, I have a, I have a th theory slash feeling of, this like to me this brings in a lot of things a lot of different topics religion is one mm -hmm. 
because religion, you always feel like there's something like more. Um, science of just like, what is the universe? Are we, is it never ending? Where does it go after that? And here's my thinking. And we'll see what you think. One, I feel like we have to be a multi universe type of world. I don't know how to explain it, but if we're like, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if we're like one universe, there could be like thousands and thousands and millions and billions of universes, right? Mm -hmm. In my head, this is my theory. In my mm -hmm. head, we are a tiny, we're so small that this is like the picture that I was just talking about. We're so small that we don't know what we're, what the bigger picture is. So meaning like if you try to think really out of the box and don't have any preconceptions and just take away all of your uh, uh, previous thoughts, could we be potentially big part of something else? Meaning are we just like a cell of a bigger being of something? And if that is the, could that mean that that is one of the reasons why people feel like there is a God or maybe you're yeah. part of something yeah. bigger because just like, for example, me, myself, a cell, my, one of my skin cells, it's this, it, it it's its own cell, but it's me too. So like, just like we are our own thing where if we are, if my theory is correct. If we are part of something that is bigger, we are ourselves, but we are also this whole thing. And maybe this, maybe this, what a, what we are a part of this whole bigger being is God or something that we think is God and that we feel connected to. Mm -hmm. But we are, we are so microscopic that we can't even figure out what we're part of. It would be the same way as a cell on our body has no idea it's part of me. It has no idea that it, the bigger picture is me. Like all the billions and billions of cells that make it up is me. To them, like they they're working all working towards one thing. Like you know what I'm saying? Like they're mm -hmm. when you when you get a cut, they're patching up the. They have no idea why they're doing it. It's just part of what they do. Exactly. But but they're working towards one over one overarching being, which is me. So to them, I'm maybe the god. Mm -hmm. So in our and so if we take that thinking put it to us are we so small that we have no idea what we're part of a world working towards one thing and that might bridge the gap of that's why people feel like there's always a big uh, a larger being that might be like godlike that is working towards that they're working towards and that 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 goes in hand in hand with science too like that is technically science but we just are so small no matter how smart we get, no matter how great our artificial intelligence gets, we are too damn small to ever figure out what we're really part of. It's just impossible. That is my theory. Good, good Does theory. Does that make good up? <laughs> do, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I, actually, I, <laughs> you, you came very close to what I'm, what I'm telling to people. Uh, let, let me put it like this. Think about us as infinite love, as beings that are infinite love. At our core, at our depth, if you will, that essence is infinity. It's endless love. And then you, you don't need to be religious or the people that are hearing, they don't need to be religious, but just imagine that the universe or God made this body and it made it in a way that it forgets exactly that. So on one part, on one aspect, we have the quote unquote God particle, if you will. It is in everything. It is in a rock. It is in a tree. It is in our dog. It is in the sky above. It is in the ground beneath our feet. God is not just what the church painted on its roof, that old man with a stick. It is in everything. It is in every plant or ant. But 
that body, our body, is designed to forget that. Because otherwise, it would come to a resolution. Like, we would figure it all out. And it would stop there. Like, imagine a world where everything is solved. <laughs> Could it go further than that? So, what the universe does, and I, I, I hope that you're following, following me here, is through that infinity that lives within each of us, in each animal or each body, it cuts us from that with our identity. So our identity is our beliefs, our convictions, the thing that we say, oh, I'm up against that. My values are this. That is our, the, the energy pattern that I call me or our identity. And it's somewhere of a mismatch between that identity, that body that is presented here and the particles that are infinity, that are linked to the source that I was describing earlier, that are linked to God or to the universe or infinity. And we are acting from this. And at the same time, we are connected, but we forget that connection. We forget that we are endless love. It sounds very similar to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We're just saying it in different ways. Yeah. You have a very uh, elusive way of talking about it, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what are, what are the principles in the book that you talk about that you think are really crucial that maybe not all of them, but what are the crucial elements of your book that you think people should take away from it? Well, actually, let me link a little bit with, uh, with what is happening right now in the world and I have a I have a chapter there where I describe about the alien within or the stigma that people hold against something or someone like I don't know you probably went through school you went through high school and you saw that that your classmates uh, might tend to label you in a certain way or in another. They might make all these jokes and ridicule you in a way. And I, I went through that, actually. So I went through uh, that pr entire process and they were calling me names. And I was at a certain point reacting to what they were doing until I learned that, oh, they are just placing that label, that stigma onto something else. Why are they doing that? Like, what is the need for that? Like, when this is quite common, and I would use this, a lot of people use the word weird. Like, weird. When someone says, oh, that person is weird, or that situation is weird, it just means that it's, un it's not comprehensible to me. I do not understand it. That's all it means. Or crazy, the word crazy. What, what does crazy really mean? It means something that I don't understand. Hence, I label it as weird or crazy. And I use these labels in order to kind of mitigate the fear that I have for not knowing. Because... I'm scared of what I don't know, of the unknown. And I say that, oh, that thing is crazy because it is linked with my fear of... So, in other words, if I deem it as crazy, my fear is lowered in a way because I know that now I'm approaching that event as something that is unpredictable. As something that, oh, might be dangerous, might take me by surprise. And actually, this really happens and in school and in 
when children are small, they are doing this unconsciously, of course, because they might see that something is off or something is strange or weird with someone. And they might not know where to point the finger. Like, why is that? But in order to better cope with the situation, with their fears, they will use that stigma or these labels in order to put a shield, a little bit of protection between them and that thing or that person. Uh, yeah. Um, I, 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 my, another th thought of, on this is like, <clears throat> those tend to be lazy words too. You know what I mean? In, in the sense of like, let's say right now, you, the way you're talking, you were doing that in like elementary school or you were in school and you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And someone says, Cosman is talking weird. Mm -hmm. I don't know. He's just talking weird. Uh, that's a lazy, it's a lazy word too. It's just like, it's not thinking deeply about it. Cosman is thinking a little bit more deeper about what the hell this world is all about. He seems to be interested in the dynamics of the universe. Like you have to think like for me to explain you and the way I'm talking to you, you have to like think a little harder. It's not, it's not easy. So if you're just going about your day and you're lazy and especially when you're really young and you don't have the vocabulary, it's just like, it's lazy and it's just, uh, it's not having the right vocabulary too, I think tends to be the, the issue. So it's part of probably what you're saying, but then it's part of like, it's just a lazy word. Like what does weird mean? Is weird mean that you think differently and how do they think differently and why do they think differently? Have you ever, have you talked to them and, and understood why they think that way? And if you think that it's so different then what's your thinking on it, what, what do you think about it? But that's too deep. People don't like to get that deep and they're lazy. And they apply label and say, you know what? Boom, label. That's too confusing. On to the next issue. Or they just don't have the capacity or the want or the need to think through it. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm uh, really conscious about the words you apply to people because mm -hmm. when you apply a label to someone when and someone else internalizes it, it can, it can impact how they think about themselves. And it's just a stupid, it's just a stupid label sometimes because you don't want to think and you don't want to think too deeply about what that actually means. Like, what does that mean? What do you mean weird? I don't know. That's one aspect I think of exactly. why labels are applied. And I just, just one thing you're spot on, but just one thing to add, like the laziness or how, humans are superficial in a way, at least at times, uh, it's linked with what technology is doing to us, like the way we're scrolling through social media or television, we have all these images that are uh, coming towards our attention, towards our field of vision, and we're bombarded with them. So we are trained to not look deeper. We are trained to look on Instagram and see a beautiful face of someone, a smile. Oh, and we connect that with, oh, that person is happy. Oh, that person has a beautiful life. While in the background, something else might occur. Yeah, I talk about this a lot, how I think we are in this age, we are being trained that, to think very, very lazily. Like six second videos, headlines of news articles. That is the most that people are, if that is the most that you are reading and, and comprehending, you could never, you could like the, to be an expert at something or to understand something thoroughly or to be able to do a really good job at something, you have to go beneath and understand. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm a big fan of like reading, 
I like read a lot of books and I try to understand concepts. Um, because if you don't, if you don't get below surface level and you're too lazy to like next time, like it, it's like a, it's like training your brain. So next time you're, you're maybe at work and you're thinking lazily and you have to take on a new project that involves you not understanding how to do something, but you have to learn how to do it. Do you have the mental capacity? Like, does your brain initially say, yeah, I'm ready to do this? Or does it say, hey, no, this is too much information. I can't do this. Like, are you training your brain to say, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing here, but I got to read these like 20 pages to understand this a little more. Like, it, in order to just be good at even just practically your job, you need to be able to read and understand concepts thoroughly outside of basic headlines, basic short videos. So it's, it's hurting people when it comes to just learning. And I think be being good at their jobs is being service level. And it's bad for politically too. Everyone, people can skew your, skew your understanding of things with a stupid headline of an article or of like a scientific journal, you know, statistics and all this stuff. Statistics can be skewed very easily hmm. if you if you run a thousand experiments at a 95 percent significance level five percent of those have a chance of being wrong so if, if i mean there's ways of skewing things and if you put something in a nice title and you mess with people's heads without understanding if someone doesn't understand the concepts that's going on you can you can manipulate people like crazy so it is a big thing i, I like to talk about is getting below surface level I would like to to kind of uh, emphasize that on one hand, it's not their fault. Like humans are creatures of comfort. And imagine if you are training your wits on a daily basis, then you have the mental capacity or you're on the edge. You, are tr you have that trained. But if on the other hand, you are sitting on the couch and you're watching television all day and you compare that person, which is not wrong, but it's doing things to you. You compare that individual with someone like who was hunting 10,000 years ago, who needed to use all his senses in the wilderness in order to survive and to hunt and to take that prey home and to eat the entire tribe to eat. He was using a lot more of his faculties, a lot more of his capacities in order to he was on the edge. He was training that with that. He, it was activated compared to sitting on the couch, being lazy, being shallow, and being at the effect, not at the cause of things. Because you are at the effect of a movie. You are at the effect of what you're watching, of what reality is showing to you. Like, look, put your attention here. Watch this. Hey, just like if you take... I don't want to sound too obnoxious, but if you take a stick or a bone to a dog and you move it, he will be like, oh, dog, a bone, a bone, a bone. He will follow that bone around. Hey, there's probably a lot of stakes and bones that are, that's, that's what the TV is. It's on at eight o'clock. It's on at nine o'clock. It's here. It's here. It's on Netflix. It's on Hulu. It's on, I, I mean, we're all guilty of it, you know? And the advertising. <laughs> I'm guilty right? of it. Advertising. I know that people, that's how they make their living or how they make money. But we are bombarded with things. And if we, if we don't filter them, if we don't have a, the wits or the capacity to filter all the information, we're, we're not an isolated island. Social conditioning affects us. Everything, everything that we are is the end result of what we are hit with. Yeah, that's why news is so bad to watch. Well, depends on, depends what you're looking for the news and what kind of news, right? Like the headlines of like all these bad incidents, one after another, that are really, really, really rare, but are highlighted on the news. If you watch that every day you probably get over stimulated and mm -hmm. like you think that if you walk out in the world, you're going to die. It's a bad way to, it's a bad way to just, you know, intake information. There's reasons and needs to watch 
news because there's things going on in the world. You need to stay updated. Course, I get that. Of course. But if you're just watching headlines of people getting killed and dying, like it's a bad way to overstimulate the body. I, I would say that it's one thing to use the information and a totally different thing to let it use you. Good way of putting it. <laughs> and I, in my 12th chapter, I was searching because I forgot, but I found it now. Uh, it's about the company you keep, about the people that you surround yourself with. And one of the first phrases, one of the first expressions there is, I will read it. Uh, there is an old saying that you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with. So we are not separate by everything. So in a way, it molds us, it shapes us. And if we are not careful not to cut off from everything, you might as well, like you might want to live in a cave or live in the jungle. If that is yours truly for your heart, then you should go away, go ahead and do that. But you don't need to do that. You just need to filter everything and be conscious of what is going on. Like, oh, I choose to watch television or I choose to gather this information. But this advertising advertisement here is not helping me. Maybe I will read something and then come back to the news or, I don't know. Yeah. Well, the issue is like, when you take advertising as the way you get information, like so advertisers, a lot of times they, they're spreading information. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't read or you don't comprehend things, you might use that as your main source of information. Mm -hmm. But that advertiser most likely is using the numbers to make them look good. So like, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's what a lot of people do when they're trying to sell you something is they're, we're number one in this or we're number one in that. But like, maybe they're skewing that to make themselves look a little better. So yeah, you, you gotta read stuff on your own. You gotta get in multiple perspectives. So you don't, you're not, you're not getting wrong information. I, I, I would want to say something. I don't want to get into politics. I don't, I usually do not talk about this. This is not the place for that, but I will say this much. I love every country in this world, America, every country. And, but the movies that are made uh, from Hollywood, for example, portray uh, like a superhero. Take, take Rambo, who is fighting on himself, the entire world, and he's very strong, like he's very big, and other countries are very small, and he can defeat them in the name of freedom or in the name of what he's fighting about. And if you, I'm not saying that all the people on this world look for, uh, look at, watch many movies, but if you watch enough movies of that, you tend, you are tempted to believe that, oh, we are big and strong and others are small. You might be. Yeah, yeah that is a, uh... That's what I'll, I don't know if it's uh, purpose, purposely done or maybe it's so consciously or maybe there is a plan, but every country wants to make themselves look good. So like if you make a movie, you're not going to, you're not going to make your country look like the bad weak one. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you want your country to have some kind of like pride in the country. I, so like, I think it's every country probably does it, whether it's the United States or whether it's right now, right now, you, Russia is probably making their media, making their people look great. And then the United States is probably making our people. Mm -hmm. look, it's just every country has their own. Maybe it's subconscious bias that just makes them want to prop up them to be better and put pride in their country. That's, that's why everything, man, is just everything has an element of bias to it that you have to account for. Even me, like I, I try to pretend like I'm trying to get information smartly and I'm all this, I read books, but I'm biased. I just don't know when and where I'm being it, but I have to understand that I am and mm -hmm. I have to hear other people's thoughts 
uh, like that's why I like doing this podcast. I talk to people from all over the world. I have Romania, United Kingdom, everywhere, India. You get to hear other people's perspectives because everyone is biased. Everyone has their own biases, and it it could be in anything. Like it doesn't have to be political bias. I'm just saying, yeah. every yeah. little piece of you is you're yeah. shaped by the experiences that you have, and your experiences are limited based on your limited experiences. That, that is actually our uh, identity. And uh, I have a chapter in the book where, where I talk about uh, the identity that we form around us. So I was, as I was hinting at the beginning, we are on one aspect, on one side, we are free and loving and we have this connection with everything and on the other side on the other side of the table if you will we are biased or we think that black people should be there and like we have these racial inequalities or we have all these things values the way that we perceive the world through that skewed view that you were you were uh, you were describing earlier so they seem opposite but the aspect the, the energy the, our identity the way that we say oh this is me because let's take your name or my name cosmic it was given to me by my parents it's <laughs> something that they've placed on top of that identity is not something that I came into this world with. It's something that, so imagine if I am loved. Like if you look into the eyes of a baby, you do not see that because it, it didn't form yet. These biases, this, oh, they are wrong and we are right. It's not there. That's why people are so attracted to babies. Like, they see that purity inside their eyes. They see that, oh, that endless love, if you will. They are not attached to something or, or detached from something. And we all can intuitively feel that that is somewhere deep, but it's buried beneath all these layers that we've built year after year after year. Years of pain and suffering from high school, years of pain and suffering from relationships, from all these atrocities that are going on and happening in our lives, build so many layers that it is hard to feel that endless love within. It is hard to connect with that. Yeah. I think the best way to explain us, I think, well, not the best way. One of the ways is we're just algorithms. We're algorithms that take in data and the data that one person might experience is completely different than another person. A person in Ukraine right now, their data, like let's say you're a young kid and you're, you haven't experienced anything but war. You're going to have a very different way of interpreting information than someone who lived in a place that has luxuries and has never had fighting. Like those are two very different people, but it's not their fault. It's just the way that they're intaking information is very different. One person is seeing people getting killed and shot and family members in war. Mm -hmm. Another person is experiencing the luxuries of on a beach and having mansions. Like, yeah, it's just like those people have, will have different experiences and, we're all we are is algorithms. We, we get, if you feed an algorithm information, it'll be able to spit out calculations of what will happen. It, like an algorithm, right? You feed it information and it can maybe like estimate or project how to, what the likelihood will be next. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I've seen war, 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 war. Likelihood is probably more war, 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 war. Or, and it's just, we're just algorithms feed, feed, fed, wow, fed a lot of information. And we're trying to work through that. And when you have a global world, everyone has different experiences. And it's very, 
it's it's just a strange thing. We're just we're just fed information, and that's that, and that's why I, I say so much. Again, like I just said a million times before, the more you read, the more you talk to people, the more you can like break your biases, because if you are only limited to the very small amount of information that you're taking in, your algorithm is going to be flawed. Mm. But if you are taking in information from all across the world or different experiences, I think you have a better algorithm. You can see the world more clearly. And and we're still going to be flawed because the earth is a speck of the universe. So even if we can have the full global experience, which is a lot, you still won't know everything because you're going to be a speck of the universe. So either way, you're damned. <laughs> either way, you're going to be you're going to be uninformed. <laughs> there's no I guess there's no there's no winning. <laughs> it's a, it's a hope, it's a dream. It's a mirage, I, I might I might say. But we, we are we are being played by our genetics also by our DNA. Uh, it's it's the same way as you describe that uh, that uh, that algorithm uh, analogy, and it's feeding us information. Our DNA is feeding us information, but there are ways to transcend that. If, yeah, what are those ways? Like, um, how to put this? Let me let me say that every individual is unique. And what it needs in that particular phase of life is unique. You cannot give someone that doesn't see beyond the room that he's in some information that is outside. It might, you might think that it inspires that person, but it might also backlash. Like it, it might, it might, he might not understand. He might go like, what is this? This is crazy. What is this? It's, it's too much for me. And you need to be sensitive enough and to modulate enough. And in, in, in my teachings as well, when I, when I speak to people, I, I try to be as careful as I can to kind of spoon feed them the information, to not overreach, to not go to something that it's too far out there for them. Because they will not comprehend and they will shut that down. And it's not helping them. Like, imagine that you are telling a two-year-old, oh, is this war going on in Ukraine and Russia? And, like, and you're explaining these complicated concepts to that two-year-old. He will look at you and like, what are you talking? Are you mad? Like, what is this? It's not appropriate for that person in his development yet. It doesn't mean that 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line, that information, he wouldn't benefit from that information. It just means that not yet, not in that moment. There is something else that is more appropriate to offer right then and there. And I like that. It's a good analogy. It's exactly how i go about like the people that come to me are, are usually people that have went through transformation processes have done a little bit of work on themselves maybe they were they went through some coaching or they went through some stuff or they might have an innate curiosity to them but they've done something and they tried things and that, that tells me actually that they are willing to, to be open about it, to have the discipline. Like if, just like in sports, if your coach is telling you like, do this exercise and this is what will get you to the next phase or to the next step. And you haven't built the, the muscle, the discipline muscle yet, then it will not help you because you will not be able to take that next step. So the first step is to build that muscle first. That is what's appropriate. And that's how you deal with your clients, right? And that's how I deal 
with my clients. I, what I've described, it sounds very esoteric and I'm talking about the cosmos and the universe. You are, the way you speak is very esoteric. Like you're an esoteric speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not start, like when I'm speaking to, to a client, I do not start with these because I start with the things that they can relate on, like their challenges. What are you struggling with? And we build from that. Well, that's good because you could lose a lot of people if you just speak of like yeah. the universe and stuff. All right. Um, Cosmin, we're coming up on the hour. Um, is there any, well, let's get a less look at that book. And if there's anything else you want to talk about it, like where can we get a copy of it? So it's called the hazard. It's called the hazard. hazard. How to change your destiny or love it now. And can we get a copy? It is on uh, Amazon. It is the, the ebook is on there. The paperback is there. And also the, the uh, audiobook is there also. Are you, are you doing the audio? Yeah, I am doing the audio. Nice. Very cool. I chose this because it is a certain transmission through the voice that a certain actor might not be able to do. So I, I recorded myself. Nice. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you coming on and talking to me about this stuff. Um, this was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to speak with you. I hope that you know you, you stay safe with all the stuff going on in the world, especially in Ukraine. So stay safe. Thank you for coming on, and I appreciate you. Likewise, Chris. This was a, a blessed hour. Thank you very much for having me. Yep. Have a really good day. Take it easy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye. bye.